can we ensure that the work we're doing now not only benefits us in the short term, but as that long term, and we have the skills, the appetite and the interest to carry space sustainability forward. Welcome back, Space Watchers, to another episode of Space Cafe Radio. I'm Emma Gatti, Senior Editor of Space Watch Global and Space Cafe Host. Today's episode is part of a joint collaboration between Space Watch Global and Secure World Foundation, focused on creating a new communication language, strategies, and outreach environment for the space domain at large. For more information about this initiative and the goals of the Space Communication Project, please contact Crystal Azelton of Secure World Foundation or myself. Our guest today is Temi Shojelola, Space Sustainability Lead at the UK Space Agency. I had a chat with Temi during the fourth Secure World Foundation Sustainability Summit, and I asked her what was her perspective and opinion on the needs of the space domain to implement debris policies. She told me some very interesting things, so please listen up. Also, please note that the audio was recorded in a room with a big echo. We removed it by infuse part the quality of the audio has been slightly affected by our post-processing work to keep the eco at bay. We apologize for that, but obviously the quality of the content remains, and this is the nice and lively things of running these interviews live on conferences on the road. So please don't be discouraged and keep listening. Tammy, thanks a lot for being here with me today. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for having me. Can you tell me a bit about, about your role within the UK Space Agency? Yeah, I am the Space Sustainability Lead. Space Sustainability Work sits within our space surveillance and tracking work. I joined in August last year to do a number of different roles. So I am the project manager for our national ADR mission. I also lead our outreach work, so which is engaging with, you know, young people, going to conferences um, and speaking to pretty much anyone that would listen or what we're doing here in the UK. And the final part of my role is raising awareness of space sustainability across the UK. So I do that by sponsoring a number of studies, research and a photography exhibition. So how do you think the space agency, the UK space agency, is interested in the topics of the summit? How, how does it position itself? Yeah, so we are the co-host alongside um, Secure Foundation for the summit. And this sort of collaboration came from just a mutual interest on in what we can do to raise sustainability across here in the UK and across Europe. So bring in space enthusiasts and specialists into London to discuss how we can move this agenda forward. We've seen the work Secure World Foundation have done in the US and globally with their research and how well they bring the community together under this umbrella of space sustainability. And we thought we could support them. So which one do you think are the most important steps that need to be t- taken now to act as fast as possible on the issue of debris removal and, in general, sustainability? I would say real investment into this area. So whether it's through skills, whether it's through research or whether it's through mission. So it's real investment. And in the UK, we've done huge amount of investment in the last couple of years, including the ADR mission that I'm currently working on. So we have a £1 million of feasibility study that we sponsored last year. And in total, we're looking to spend £21 million on this national mission. Commitment. <laughs> yeah. As well as, you know, invested into ESA, who we work collaboratively with and support um, the research they've done or whether it's clear one. We are, or Adonis, we've been doing a lot of them funding with ESA. Yeah, and so Josef Aschbacher last week was uh, actively openly inviting the UK to stick to the ESA's plan. So yeah. obviously it's good to see that the UK is still involved. Uh, Absolutely. And I'll say the second part I would say is continuous communication across the UK, across Europe and globally. Yesterday we had a regulator to regulator meeting or large constellation, and it was amazing just to see the diversity from the West and the Global South discussing about how we could collaboratively work together. And I think collaboration in terms of research and knowledge and cross uh, 
almost cross-pollination of skills and intelligence is very much necessary. So we do a lot of surveillance tracking, but we do this with space agencies across the world. We would not be able to do the work we're doing without that importance of collaboration. And I would say, finally, it's the next generation, right? How can we ensure that the work we're doing now not only benefits us in the short term, but as that long term, and we have the skills, the appetite and the interest to carry space sustainability forward. In a sort of way, space is a long-term project. So it's really good what you just say about like being sure that space remains sustainable for the next generation. Yeah. I know that you are so moving to a different type of task. Can you tell me more about that? Yes. So I am going to be editing a new strategy called Inspiration. And what we're looking to do is, in essence, inspire young people to look into STEM, but particularly space. And it's a mix of technical and non-technical roles or technical and non-technical qualifications at different levels. So whether it's through apprenticeship or whether it's through an undergrad or or furthermore within the education spectrum. But what we are looking to just inspire from a very young age in my current role, we do this already. We work with BBC News Rail, which is a kids channel, and just talk about space sustainability with schools and from primary school level. So this is kids from like three, four, up until 11, and then 11 to 16, which is um, secondary school and at university level as well. So ensure that interest in space, which a lot of kids have a very young age, doesn't diminish. So I'm hoping to, in my new capacity as head of um, inspiration, to carry on and keep that fire burning on space. So the topic of communication is very interesting because we live in over uh, information overloaded uh, world and our, how we do information, how we communicate is very important. And as you said, space in a sort of way really attract young kids' imagination and it's very important to sustain it until uh, the adult age. As uh, the space industry stands right now. Do you think that there are some specific communication issues that we should tackle together as an industry? I think there's this idea that space is so far away, right? It's almost like a Star Trek or a Star War, and that's where your imagination is. But Leo, it's a lot closer than we think. I'm currently sponsoring, alongside ESA, a photographer called Max Alexander, and he's working on an exhibition that, that rings space to real life. So it's got portraits of inspirational figures within the space community, but also looking at how people can feel, see, smell in space. So things like your iPhone and GPS, to your delivery drivers who rely on that, to your cash point, to bring in, making space real tangible so people can realise actually Firstly, how reliant we are on space. But secondly, how close we are to space. And thirdly, how we are slowly destroying it. There's a study I heard in the 1960s where we had about less than five debris in space. And now we've got over 900,000. So it's making people, given that interest, almost like how we see it environmental sustainability, ignite that interest and that passion for people to know what we're doing up there. That's a very interesting point. Uh, do you think that it is necessary to raise awareness towards space ecology in a sort of way? Maybe change the mindset that we cannot just go out there and use it as our new trash when we just pollute it. Yeah, absolutely. But I think this is why like, summits like this is so important because it shows this general consensus globally of how reliant we are in space and how we want to make things better. We've got almost 300 people upstairs at this summit with a lot more dining in from around the world just talking about how can we use space more efficiently and more safely how can we remove debris without creating even more debris and how do, do we do this in the best possible way not just for the west but within the global south and ensuring they're part of that conversation and more importantly how we ensure that is that equity for everybody to have a say within the space sustainability. And again, I think that's the importance of this summit. Do you see in space an opportunity to create that new baseline of equity and sheer melt that you were just mentioning? I think we should got a long way to go. I feel like the fact that almost like the fire has been ignited 
But I think there's a lot that, you know, discussion that needs to take place. As I mentioned yesterday, we have the regulator to regulate a meeting and this idea of equity came up and we had a good conversation about it, but everyone was actually, there's a lot more we can do with this. So just seeing in that room alone, just how people, were, their brains were like turning on, what does this look like? What does it feel like? And we had representation in the room from Nigeria, from Egypt, from Rwanda, who can talk about what does equity look like for the global South to have a meaningful conversation on space sustainability. So it's amazing just to see in a couple of hours how just interest is starting to brew and we're hoping it doesn't end tomorrow when this summit is over, but everyone takes and connects with each other and moves this dialogue forward. So what is the most important thing that should happen right now, you think, in terms of this vision of equity? I think it's, it can't be a talking shop. It can't be a thing where we all meet each other at summit, where it's Cup US or IAC or you know, um, the Secure Foundation Summit. It, it can't be a t- talking shop. It has to be backed by policy. It has to be backed by regulation. It has to be backed, and it has to be a discussion with it with the private sector, the policy makers, DMIA. Everyone has to be in a room, and I think also drive the pace into this change. So we can't be like, oh, we'll do this in three years. We need to start now. So drive pace, continue engaging with each other. What's the final message that you would like to get across? I would like to say that here at the UK, Space Energy, we're really proud to be part of the discussion. And we're backing it with policy. We're backing it with funding. I would just repeat what my CEO, Bill Bates, said this morning, which is, If you see someone that has an interest or has knowledge, engage with them. Let's keep this conversation going. Let's keep engaging with each other. Let's keep sharing intelligence, knowledge, insight, research. Let's keep working together. Fantastic. Demi, thanks a lot for sharing your knowledge and passion with me. It was a pleasure. (laughs) Thank you for listening to Space Cafe Radio on tour in London. This episode is part of a joint collaboration between Spacewatch Global and Secure World Foundation, focused on creating a new communication language, strategies, and outreach environment for the space domain at large. If you want to keep the pulse of the space industry, please visit our website at www.spacewatch.global and subscribe to our newsletters. And of course, don't forget to become a Space Watcher. I'm Emma Gatti, Senior Editor of Spacewatch Global, your independent perspective on space. See you next time. Ciao.